Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is another update on the situation with regards to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And in today's episode, we'll have an update on what's going on with regards to the warfare. As you'll know, if you've been following the channel, Ukraine have been making progress. They've been pushing back the Russian forces. So I'll give you the very latest news on that front. We'll then talk about the latest problems that have emerged with regards to Russia's mobilization of more men for the fight in Ukraine. And this doesn't relate to the fact that everybody is making a break for the border. This actually refers to all of the people who've turned up for active service. And it turns out that a lot of people who've been given the conscription papers are not actually fit for service. We'll talk about concerns that are being raised with regards to the number of farmers that are being conscripted because Russia is a major producer of a number of different foodstuffs and it's a major source of revenue from an export perspective. I'll then tell you about the latest scheme that Russia is proposing whereby it will be offering credit facilities, i.e. debt, to some of the poorer countries who buy its food exports. And then finally today I'll wrap up with my summaries to what I think the implications of all of the latest developments are both for Russia and the global economy. So before we get started on all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video if you're enjoying the content, please subscribe if you haven't done so already, still on that push for 200,000, so if you could help that would be fantastic. Don't forget I always include chapters, so if you don't have time to watch the whole video you can pick and choose which sections you want to watch. And if you'd like to support the channel please have a look below where you'll find links to YouTube super thanks and membership as well as buy me a coffee, Patreon and Amazon shopping links. Russian flags were being taken down in the town of Liman, according to footage posted by a Ukrainian official, after Kyiv on Sunday claimed full control of the Eastern Logistics Hub. This is Ukraine's most significant battlefield gain in weeks. It provides a potential staging post for attacks to the east while heaping further pressure on the Kremlin. Russia's defense ministry said on Saturday that it was pulling troops out of the area, quote, in connection with the creation of a threat of encirclement. Moscow's forces had captured Liman in May and used it as a logistics and transport hub for its operations in the north of the Donetsk region. The stinging setback for Russian President Vladimir Putin comes after he proclaimed the annexation of four regions on Friday, an area that includes Liman. Russia moved to annex these regions after holding what it called referendums, votes that were denounced by Kyiv and Western governments as illegal and coercive. In the previous update, we talked about the fact that Ukrainian forces have now taken the key city of Liman. And this area is seen as being crucial because it was providing a transport and supplies hub for Russia to cover the northern parts of the occupied territories. And by taking this city, Ukrainian forces have cut off those future supplies and further weakened Russia's position in the north of the Ukraine occupied territories. And this victory really compounds the successes that the Ukrainian forces have achieved over the last few weeks, whereby they've taken back over 6,000 square kilometers of land. And you can see on this map the considerable progress that has been made. The red areas are the sections occupied currently by Russia, and the pink or lilac area at the top is the area that's been taken back by Ukrainian forces. So there's a really big concerted effort going on in the north of the region to push back Russian forces. And over the last few weeks, we've seen a number of retreats made by Russia, and thousands of Russian troops have left the area. But the latest news of Ukrainian successes is now coming in the south of the occupied regions around Kurzon. It's been reported that Ukrainian forces have recaptured towns along the west bank of the Dnipro River in southern Ukraine. This map provides more details of the area and shows the situation seven days ago. However, it's now been reported that Ukrainian forces have recaptured towns along the west bank of the Dnipro River. The fighting is still ongoing, so no official statements have been released by Ukraine or Russia with regards to this matter. However, it's been reported that Russian forces have been forced back as far as Duchani, which represents an advance of around 25 miles in the last 24 hours. It's also been reported that Ukraine have destroyed all of the major crossings on the Dnipro River, which is enormously wide and could trap thousands of Russian troops on the far side and cut off all of their supplies. The latest advances are really significant for two reasons. Firstly, these gains are now coming in the south of the occupied territory. So everything that's going on in the north is continuing and Ukraine are now doubling down their efforts and trying to hit Russia on two sides. And that's obviously going to be a problem from Russia's perspective because they can't target all of their efforts in one area. They're having to split their resources in the north 
and the South simultaneously. So the double-pronged attack from Ukraine is causing more pressure and more strain for Russia, its troops and its supply lines. And the second major issue here is that these advances are coming in the areas that Russia has recently annexed. So from President Putin's perspective, all of this territory is now deemed to be Russia and Ukrainian forces are pushing back Russian troops in this newly annexed territory. And it'll be really interesting to see what President Putin's response is to this, because as you'll be aware, he recently came out and stated that any attack on Russian soil could be defended by any means necessary. So the undertone of that statement was that nuclear strikes could be used if Ukrainian forces try to invade the newly annexed territories from Russia's perspective. And from a political perspective, Ukraine has obviously ignored all of these annexed annexation statements and actually it's increasing its effort so it now appears to be more committed to pushing Russia back to take control of these territories that Russia has claimed. As soon as President Putin made his speech on national TV advising the nation that 300,000 people were required to be called up to go and fight in Ukraine, there has been chaos all across the country. Initially, we saw protests on the streets. However, they were quickly stamped out by the authorities who came in, arrested protesters, and it was reported that a lot of those people who were arrested were subsequently conscripted and forced to go and fight in Ukraine. So everybody quickly decided not to continue with the protests. However, there were a few individuals who decided to turn up at enlistment offices and fire handguns and throw Molotov cocktails. And the other major response to the announcement has been a mass break for the border. We have seen hundreds of thousands of people leaving Russia for places like Kazakhstan, Georgia, Finland before they closed the border, and even Mongolia. So I think it's fair to say that the mobilization so far has been a complete disaster. This has been really badly received by the people of Russia. Nobody wants to go and fight in Ukraine. Up until this point, the special military operation, as it's been deemed in Russia, was purely a military effort that had nothing to do with everybody's day-to-day -day life. As soon as the mobilization was announced, it caused mass panic because everybody realized that their husbands or sons or fathers could actually be called up, sent to Ukraine, and may never come back. But to add a little bit of extra spice to the chaos that's going on right now, we've now heard reports that up to half of the people who've actually been conscripted, so the people who've turned up to serve the country, have been sent home. Mikhail Degtyarev, the governor of the Karborosk region of Russia's Far East, posted a video on Telegram in which he said, In 10 days, several thousand of our countrymen received summons and arrived at the military registration and enlistment offices. About half of them we returned home as they did not meet the selection criteria for entering the military service. And as a direct result of this, the military commissar Yuri Leiko was removed from his post However, it was confirmed that this would not affect the mobilization plan. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the motivation for posting this video was by a senior Russian official. My guess was that this was an ill-informed way of trying to allay everybody's fears that if the people turning up are not actually fit for service, then they will be returned home and released from their obligation. So maybe this was to put everybody's mind at rest that if you're too old or you're not fit enough, then you'll get released. But I don't actually think that this message serves that purpose. In reality, this is another embarrassment for the Russian military forces because not only have they caused mass chaos amongst the population by stating that they're going to call people up on an enforced basis and it's reported that the 300,000 that President Putin originally referred to could be as much as 1.2 million. But in addition to the problems that the mobilization news has caused, we're now hearing that half of the people who are actually being called up aren't actually fit to go and fight in Ukraine. So this is a complete wasted effort for everybody involved. Firstly, the process of actually selecting people doesn't seem to be working. They're not able to pick out the right individuals to go and fight in Ukraine. Secondly, the people who are receiving those call-ups are having to leave their daily life, leave their jobs, go to these centres, report for duty, they're going through testing, and then they're being told, you're not fit enough, please go away. So they've wasted a lot of man hours, caused a lot of upset and confusion amongst their families. I'm sure there's a lot of people very unhappy about this. And ultimately, at the end of the process, Russia haven't got the number of people that they're looking for to send over to Ukraine. So that means that they're going to have to go through the whole system again. They're going to have to call up more people, bring more people in, do the testing, and then get people to go over to Ukraine. So this is a complete shambles. If around half of the people that you're calling up are not fit for service, then your processes and your data and your systems are completely out of date 
and entirely useless. So this clearly exposes problems that exist within the military systems in Russia and show that their databases and their technology is not up to speed. And as I've mentioned before, technology is one of the biggest challenges for Russia right now. The sanctions that have been applied against Russia mean it's going to be more difficult to access latest technology. So they'll start going backwards in terms of their development. And it looks like their systems are already out of date and not fit for purpose. So there are some really worrying signs for Russia here. Russia is one of the largest producers of food globally and one of the biggest exporters. And concerns are now being raised about the number of farmers and agricultural workers that are being called up as part of the mobilization effort. This chart shows the total production of cereals in Russia over the last 20 years and shows that in 2021, Russia produced over 125 million metric tons of cereal. And out of that figure, almost 50 million tons was provided for the export markets. Russia is currently the world's largest exporter of wheat, and wheat is critical to world food supplies because it's crushed to make flour, and flour is the basic ingredient that's needed for making bread and pasta and noodles and couscous which are the basic food groups eaten by a massive percentage of the world population. And Russia's importance in terms of world food supplies is not just restricted to wheat. It's also one of the world's biggest exporters of barley, which is used in a lot of livestock feed, and sunflower seeds, which are used to produce oil, which is a basic ingredient in a lot of cooking. And the export of all of this agricultural output is really important to the Russian economy, and in 2021 generated around 7.5 trillion rubles of income, which equates to around $130 billion. With regards to the issue of agricultural workers being recruited for the mobilization, President Putin has stated, I would like to address regional heads and the heads of agricultural enterprises. As part of the partial mobilization, agricultural workers are also being drafted. Their families must be supported. I ask you to pay special attention to this issue. And concerns are rising because autumn is a busy season for farmers as they sow winter wheat for next year's crop and harvest soybeans and sunflower seeds. And the removal of agricultural workers has come at a bad time because winter grain sowing has already been significantly delayed by rain. So once again, we're seeing an unintended consequence of this war feeding through directly into the economy of Russia. By recruiting people from the rural areas, it's causing major problems for those economies. Firstly, you're taking workers out, so that means there's less productivity in the region. Secondly, the agricultural season is 12 months a year for Russia, because crops need to be sown now for 2023 harvesting. And thirdly, you've got a problem with regards to how you're going to keep all of those economies moving. Now, President Putin specifically said that we need to look after the families of these regions because they're losing their main source of income. So that's going to put further burden onto the Russian state. So overall here, the consequences of this mobilization are really negative, firstly for the local environment, but secondly for the Russian economy as a whole, because the charts we just looked at showed how important agricultural exports are to Russia. So if these areas produce less grain next year, then most of that grain will be used by the Russian population because they're self-sufficient in a lot of food substances, but it will massively reduce the amount that they're able to sell to other countries and therefore will reduce the income of the Russian economy at a time when the economy is already decimated by a lot of the sanctions that have been applied. So this is really bad news for everybody. And of course, the other issue here is that the world food supply is quite delicately balanced. So Russia is providing a large percentage of certain grains to different countries around the world. If Russia isn't able to sell that amount of grain next year, then that means those countries will go short. And there just isn't enough availability elsewhere to be able to fill those gaps at short notice. So we could see a further heightening of the food crisis that's been in existence ever since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February. Russia exports large volumes of grain to a variety of countries around the world. And to give you a flavour of the countries that Russia is selling to, this graphic shows the destination for Russian exports of wheat. So you can see that historically Egypt are buying over $2.5 billion worth of wheat, Turkey $1.4 billion, Bangladesh over $500 million, and the next largest markets were Nigeria, Yemen, Azerbaijan, Sudan, United Arab Emirates, Senegal and Vietnam. 
Now, if you follow the channel, you'll know that I've posted specific videos on the economies of Egypt, Turkey and Bangladesh over recent months. And all of those countries are in financial difficulty right now. They've got crises going on. And that represents a problem for Russia because their biggest clients for the export of food substances are all struggling financially. And this obviously comes at a time when the market for Russia's exports is narrowing because of all of the sanctions that have been applied by the West. A lot of countries don't want to buy any Russian products. So Russia really needs to keep its existing supply chains in place and try to sell more of that product to those countries. And it's now been announced that Russia is considering providing trade finance to all of its customers of its grain in order to keep those supplies flowing. So what this means is that Russia will put debt facilities in place for all of these countries in order to keep those supplies coming. So if they can't afford to pay, then Russia will just give it to them on credit. Now, providing debt facilities to countries that are struggling financially is obviously a big risk because there's a chance that they won't be able to pay you back. So then we need to ask the question of what happens in the event that these countries are unable to repay Russia. And this really opens up the whole can of worms with regards to the debt trap. And we've talked about this before with regards to China. China has been rolling out its Belt and Road Initiative over the last 10 years or so. And a lot of the countries that it lent money to for infrastructure projects were unable to repay those facilities. And China is now in restructuring discussions. And if you follow the channel, you'll be aware that Hambantota port in Sri Lanka was financed by the Chinese. Sri Lanka were unable to repay. And the negotiated settlement that was agreed was that China took a 99 year lease on that port. So China potentially could set up its own facilities, a Hambantota in Sri Lanka. And there's a lot of concern that they could set up military facilities and use that as a military base. So a smaller country that's struggling for cash taking on debt facilities opens itself up to those sort of negotiations. And that's really the risk that we're looking at right now. Russia is happy to keep supplying grain to all of these countries who are struggling for cash. But the big question is what will happen in two or three years time if those countries are not able to actually make the payments? What will Russia want in exchange to cancel off the debt facilities? So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, what we're seeing at the moment is Ukraine is making continued advances. It's pushing back all of the Russian troops. Russia seems to be entirely on the retreat at the moment. There are no wins that are being reported at all from Russia. And the mobilization effort appears to be a shambles in Russia. Firstly, a lot of people are trying to avoid it. They're leaving the country. They're making their way to the borders or they're going into hiding. They're leaving their jobs and their homes to avoid being detected. And from what we've heard from the head of one of the regions, it seems that around half of the people who are actually being called up aren't fit for purpose. So they're not actually going to ever make it to Ukraine. So Russia is really struggling right now, both on the offensive side and also trying to get more people to go to Ukraine. So they're really on the back foot here. And Ukraine are taking this as an opportunity to be able to push forward on two fronts. So previously, they'd been making a lot of progress in the north and they've taken Le Mans and they're now pushing heavily in the south as well. And that's going to put even more pressure on Russia because they're going to have to split their forces. They can't just focus on one of the areas to win back control because they will then lose further ground in the other area. So this looks like a really critical time in terms of the war. And it's really interesting to note that Russia is pulling people out of the rural areas. And those rural areas are really important to the Russian economy in terms of generating lots of income from the export of all of the agricultural products. So by pulling more people out of Russia, it's causing more problems because they won't be able to produce as much on the agricultural perspective. Therefore, they will earn less income. And up until now, we've only really been focusing on oil and gas. They are two of the biggest earners for Russia, and they're obviously seeing their markets reducing right now because of all of the sanctions. But the problems with the agricultural side are really self-inflicted. They're causing themselves issue by removing people from that workforce, and they simply don't have anybody to replace them. In a lot of the rural areas, most people are employed in agriculture. When you remove somebody from that workforce, there's not a large amount of unemployed people waiting to take their jobs. It doesn't work like that. So the mobilization effort will definitely hurt Russia. And this will also feed through into the general economy, because as I mentioned in other videos, people will have to leave their place of work. And that means that you'll have less productivity in those companies. Therefore, they will make less money and therefore Russia will earn less taxes and less revenue. So all of the 
this is really bad news for Russia. And the reason that I think we're at a turning point in this war is that Russia just simply doesn't seem to have the resources to be able to fight back. It's losing ground on a daily basis. And the big concern here is that if they don't have enough manpower to be able to push back, that President Putin will then resort to some other form of attack. And the most obvious means at his disposal are nuclear weapons. And if he does decide to press that red button, then obviously that opens up the potential for some sort of World War III scenario, which is obviously not what any of us want and without going into any of the details would be very bad news for the global economy. So I'll keep you posted on any further news and developments as and when they happen. If you've liked what I've said today, please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.